It's now a classic of modern American cinema and the reigning king of summer blockbusters. You guys requested it loudly and frequently, so we listened and found every difference we could between the novel and the film Jaws. Jaws. I'm Michael Truly. And I'm Casey Redmond. So without further ado, and no restraint on spoilers, what's, what's the, the difference? difference? In 1974, Peter Benchley released a novel about a great white shark that preys upon a small resort town and the voyage of three men to kill it. The book was an instant success, selling over 20 million copies worldwide and staying on the bestseller list for some 44 weeks. Part of its quick popularity was due to director Steven Spielberg and his producers, who were already in pre-production on the film adaptation. So they bought hundreds of copies each on its release day to send to opinion makers. Once on the bestseller list, people's curiosity peaked and it spread like hay fever. The the film adaptation was released the following year in June 1975. Ah uh, yes, the summer of love. And Jaws. If you haven't seen this movie, stop. Just stop. Click the watch later button on this video. Go watch it right now. Go on. Both versions begin the story with the death of a tourist. Her name is Chrissy Watkins in the film. And Christy in the novel. Oh, what a delightful change. So she's dead, and then the shark kills a boy and a senior citizen in one afternoon. But in the movie, only the boy, Alex Kittner, is killed. A novel can give you more detail than a film, and some of the detail in Jaws works for the story's benefit. We learn much more about the island's economic problems, which helps explain why everyone is so reluctant to close the beaches. The 1,000 people who live in Amity year-round make all of their money in the summer, when the population balloons to 10,000, most of whom are money-spending tourists. Close the beaches, and by next spring, everyone will be on welfare. Also in the novel, Benchley describes some early scenes from the shark's point of view, making it clear Jaws is an unthinking, instinct-driven eating machine. But these scenes, while scientifically accurate, contradict later ones, where the shark seems capable of strategic thought. The skeleton of the story is all there in Benchley's book, but there are some pretty drastic differences in how the book portrays the main characters compared to the movie. For one thing, almost all of the characters are terrible people in the novel. Spielberg has said in interviews that he found the characters in Benchley's book so so unsympathetic that he actually wanted the shark to win. He was gonna have to make some changes to make sure everyone liked these guys. Brody in the book is similar to his movie counterpart, but he's also more of a uh -huh. In the novel, Brody and his wife have three sons, Billy, Martin Jr., and Sean. In the movie, there are only two Brody children, Mike and Sean. In the film, Brody and his wife Ellen get along pretty darn well. But in the book, they are constantly at each other's throats. Before she married Brody, Book Ellen was living a swanky, carefree lifestyle as a New York socialite. She feels trapped in her marriage, and Brody is impotent against her anger. This leads to one of the biggest differences. Ellen is so unhappy with her marriage that when Matt Hooper shows up, she begins having an affair with him. It turns out Book Hooper's older brother used to date Ellen, so Ellen sees having an affair with Hooper as a way of recapturing her old, carefree life. This entire subplot is cut from the film. The closest the two come to a fight is when Brody and his wife banter about Amity dialects and later suggesting they get drunk and fool around. Speaking of Hooper, Hooper is a bit of a blowhard in the film, but mostly it's Richard Dreyfus at his most charming. In the book, he is a downright nasty son of a bitch. He's super proud of his Ivy League education and pretty much resents anyone else having opinions other than his. Ellen and Hooper frequently meet in a seedy hotel for their affair, and Brody begins to suspect things. While the movie does portray Brody as something of a schlub, completely out of his element when he's out on Quint's boat, the book makes him a man constantly resenting his advancing age and feeling jealous of Hooper. There's even a part in the book where Brody tries to strangle Hooper with his old man hands. Which again, simply does not happen in the movie. The film's mayor character is a clueless fool, constantly trying to shrug off the shark warnings because he wants Amity to make money from all those tasty tourists. That's all the motivation he needs in the movie. Him being a dope is perfectly acceptable on its own. But the book actually gives the mayor more of a motive for keeping the beaches open. In the novel, the mayor owes money to his mysterious silent partners and wants to keep the beaches open so he can skim what he needs from the island's profits to pay them back. These silent partners turn out to be the Mafia. The reporter Harry Meadows uncovers the conspiracy. The Mafia has sunk oodles of money in real estate on Amity, and if the mayor were to close the beaches, he'd be fitted with cement shoes and sleeping with the fishes. Yeah, forget about it. Speaking of that reporter, in the novel, newspaper man Harry Meadows has a much bigger role, hushing up the shark attack, uncovering Mayor Vaughn's underworld connections, and hiring ichthyologist Matt Hooper. While in the film, he's a bit part, played by co-screenwriter Carl Gottlieb. Quint also has some differences. In the film, Robert Shaw's boozy, loud performance is the stuff of legend. But book Quint barely
barely speaks. He's nowhere near as memorable as his film counterpart. The author's version of Quint is merely a ripoff of Captain Ahab from Moby Dick. He has no reason to hate the fish beyond the fact that he's a hunter and wishes to catch the best prey. Possibly the best addition Spielberg made is the backstory given to film Quint. He was a member of the Navy and was on the ship that delivered the Hiroshima bomb. This ship famously sank and its mission was so secret that help didn't come for days. He recounts in haunting fashion being stuck in the water and fighting off sharks, watching others killed and eaten. And in this scene, we know just why Quint is the way he is. This backstory gives us one of the best speeches in movie history. Additionally, in the novel, when they go after their shark, Brody discovers that Quint is using illegal bait for chum. He is capturing baby dolphins and chopping them up. Jesus Christ. This added a level of conflict between Quint and Brody. And possibly everyone who's ever existed that thought dolphins were cute. That is not present in the film. In the movie, Quint does give Brody shit once he's on the boat, but we don't really get anything from Brody, at least not at the level we see in the novel. In the end, Book Quint doesn't go out being chomped to death by the shark like movie Quint does, but rather his foot becomes tangled in the barrel ropes and is pulled underwater by the shark, drowning. Similar to how Ahab dies in Moby Dick. Coincidence? In the film, once the three men are out to sea, they stay there, creating a perfect sense of isolation and hopelessness while the shark is in full attack mode. In the book, every night after the three shark hunters turn up empty-handed, they just go home. This drastically lowers the stakes. It's nighttime. Let's go sleep in our beds. Hooper's fate in the book differs drastically from the film. In the book, Hooper tries to kill the shark with a bang stick and goes into the water in his shark cage. And as in the movie, the shark is like, <laughs> nah, -uh, I'm still gonna try to nibble your bits. In the film, he wants to use a hypodermic needle to inject the fish with strychnine and LSD. I, I can't back up the second one. Hooper narrowly escapes in the film as the shark attempts to crush the cage and gets stuck in its remains. But in the book, the shark crushes Hooper's cage and eats him. <laughs> oh. In the original script, Hooper would have also died in the film, but this was changed during production. Spielberg knew he was making a big spectacle movie, and he knew he had to end things with a bang. The book's ending is, well, let's just say it's anticlimactic. Uh, I would call it flaccid, just a real dangly dick of an ending. So we know what happens in the film. Brody blows up the shark. Yeah! Benchley disliked the change and claimed that the air tank explosion was unbelievable. In the Mythbusters Jaws special, which aired during Discovery Channel Shark Week, the Mythbusters confirmed Benchley's theory as the scene was deemed busted due to the fact that in reality, the air tank would just fly around like a rocket after being punctured. They would have actually needed C4 to create the explosion. But who fucking cares? They blow up a shark. Movies, am I right? Yeah, let's do it. In the book, as Brody floats in the wreckage of the ship after the shark has destroyed it and waits for the shark to swim towards him, he more or less accepts his fate as soon to be shark food. It looks like this is the end for Chief Brody. The shark is swimming to him. Brody is praying that it ends quickly. Then the shark dies. Okay, fine. It's not as anticlimactic as that. The shark has deep wounds from Quint's harpoon in his side, so it dies from its injuries. But it's a pretty wimpy ending for a great white monster. That'll merit four sequels. Why did the changes happen? Well, other than the direct choice to make the characters more likable on paper, the film was set to follow the book much more closely and feature the shark more prominently. Though the mechanical shark would break down often and ruin entire days of shooting, the film was also over budget and way past schedule. The suits at the studio would call every day and tell Spielberg that he would never work again. It was a nightmare on location every day, but if these circumstances were different, we may not have gotten such an amazing film. Since the mechanical shark frequently didn't work, they had to come up with other ways to make it appear the shark was there. This is where Spielberg had the idea to film swimmers from underneath the surface, allowing the audience to view and imagine the shark looking up at them, waiting to pick one off. In addition to these underwater shots, they also came up with the idea of using barrels speared into the fish as a way to feature the shark without actually featuring the shark. After being harpooned by three of these barrels, the shark is still able to submerge and disappear. But sure enough, the shark returns for its victims, and as the barrels pop out of the water and breach the surface, they almost appear taunting. The cliche tells us that the book is always better than the movie, but for all of those reasons we mentioned earlier, we have to say that in the case of Jaws, the, the book, book is, is not, not better than, than the, the movie. movie. Yeah, but my slash fiction is, you got Hooper and you got Quint on a boat, they just sharing a nice lasagna, and suddenly they just start kissing. Hands are going everywhere. Ah, uh, is it sexy? Fucking forget about it. Well, those are our thoughts, but we'd like to hear yours. Let us know in the comments what you thought about all the changes. Like this video if you want to see more of What's the Difference, and make sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more awesome movie content. See you guys next time.